All right. Well, we're going to uh, uh, look at a short passage in 1 Thessalonians in chapter 2, the first 12 verses, if you want to turn there. A couple of reasons for doing this. And uh, the one of the, is the fact that having studied through uh, the book of Romans and done our summary last week and refamiliarizing ourselves with those major doctrinal issues in regards to salvation that we went through, hey, everybody's under condemnation. We learned what justification was what sanctification was, the security of the believer, and so forth, and the practical aspects. All of that, in a sense, was to so that we can know for ourselves about our salvation, but of course so we can share it with, uh, uh, with others. Paul even gave us some important apologetics at the beginning uh, of that uh, epistle, the idea that God is the creator, and therefore uh, everybody knows that. Everybody has the external witness of creation. Uh, they have an internal witness of a conscience whether they're religious or not, uh, and everybody knows that. And Solomon says everybody's got eternity written in their hearts. Everybody's got the same issues and sin problems that only can be solved through a relationship with uh, our God through Jesus Christ. But it's up to us whether we'll deliver that message or not. Uh, and in this passage of Scripture, Paul actually, uh, at least I've derived from Paul's writings, nine principles uh, for evangelism, for sharing our faith. Uh, in Jesus Christ, and I hope it'll be helpful to you. Uh, the first one is found in verses 1 and 2, and again, we're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Uh, verse 1 says, For you know yourselves, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain, but even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel uh, in much conflict. So the first thing we'd say certainly is that uh, when we, uh, we must share the gospel despite opposition because uh, there's going to be some opposition. Uh, as John says in, uh, in John chapter 6, uh, not everybody that sees me is going to believe me. Not everybody is going to uh, hear the message. Some are simply going to say, no, thank you. Some are going to really create problems for you. They're going to be in opposition to you. And certainly Paul knew that uh, very well as we uh, uh, you know, see his exploits there through the book of Acts. Uh, but our job is to deliver the message. Uh, our job is not the success. Uh, you know, of course, the power is in, in the gospel. Paul says uh, clearly in Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God for salvation for everyone who would believe. The power is in God's word in the gospel itself that we deliver. But there's going to be some opposition. Uh, our job, our position as believers is simply to deliver the good news. Uh, Pastor Chuck says the glorious thing about serving God is that it's a salary position, not commission. Uh, we're not really paid with or for the results. We're paid for our faithfulness in fulfilling the call of God in our hearts, the obedience to Jesus uh, as our master. Uh, it's, uh, the reward in the end is not for uh, the success of how many we led to the Lord. It's how faithful we've actually been uh, in delivering the message uh, itself. Uh, remember uh, Paul in Macedonia, he has the vision of, uh, excuse me, in the book of Acts, the uh, vision of the man from Macedonia calling him uh, in Acts 16, 9, where it says, And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now after he'd seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to him. How'd it go when he got there? A lot of opposition, a lot of persecution, beating, imprisonment. Paul could have thought, oh, I, I missed that one. You know, I thought the Lord was calling us over here, but it's not going so well. No, I don't think so. I think Paul was firmly convinced that God called him. And even if they had opposition, he still was going to go forward with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The fact that you may be led by the Lord to share with someone and they don't receive it, it doesn't seem to go well. That's okay. The, the idea is, it doesn't mean that God wasn't leading you. It doesn't mean that God wasn't in it. In fact, sometimes when there's the strongest opposition, it's sometimes an indication that God really was in it. We use the uh, little proverbial saying that if you throw a rock into a pack of dogs, uh, it's the one that got hit that yelps the most. And, uh, and sometimes when there's a lot of oppositions, it's an indication that God is really at work in that person's life. Uh, and we need to remember that, uh, again, we're, we're, uh, we're not on a commission. <laughs> we're uh, on a salary. God's just asking us to be faithful uh, with the, the message he's given us. In James uh, chapter 4, verse 2, he talks about the fact that uh, opposition will sometimes indicate the motive of our own hearts. 
Uh, there, uh, James says, you lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight in war. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend, uh, spend it on your pleasures. The context is going through trials. Uh, the need is to pray and ask for wisdom, and God will give it if we ask it uh, in faith, and we're not double-minded and unstable in, uh, in what we're all about in terms of the Lord. Uh, but as we ask, the concern is we ask with the right motive. Uh, motive is very important in sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Opposition might come uh, if we're dissuaded that easily. We might need to examine our own hearts. Uh, is it our motive? Are we really concerned? Why are we sharing the gospel with Jesus of Jesus Christ with other people? Is it because I want to be able to tell someone about the person I led to the Lord? Is it because I want to feel better about myself that I did something good today in sharing the gospel? Or do I really believe that unless that person receives the gospel of Jesus Christ, they will spend all eternity in hell? See, that's to be our, our motivation. William Booth, the uh, founder of uh, the Salvation Army, said that after he trained all, all of his workers to go out and preach the gospel, he says, if I could... The thing I would like to do is to dangle them by their heels over the fires of hell for three days and three nights. Then I would yank them back, and then I would send them out to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. That needs to be in our, our understanding. That's, that's true, right? I mean, that's the truth. And we need to understand that and see people around us uh, in that light. God cares about our motives because we're going to get uh, some opposition, even the Apostle Paul did. Secondly, in verse 2, we must share the gospel with God's uh, help. Uh, second half of verse 2, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. Uh, bold in our God, despite strong opposition. We need the Lord's help. Uh, it's not easy to, to share the gospel. It's not easy, sometimes we say, to get from small talk to big talk. You know, we can watch the examples of Jesus doing that with the woman at the Samaritan well where you know, he begins to talk about water and living water, and he's able to jump it, you know, we say, from small talk to big talk. One of the good things about living in Hawaii is that basically, you're going to get your exception, but basically people are pretty friendly, and you can go up and just pretty much talk to total strangers, and, and they don't even think you're weird. <laughs> and, uh, and you can talk high school football. You can talk uh, any, number, uh, any number of subjects. Uh, you can talk about the surf or the wind or the weather or whatever's going on or the economy. And, uh, and the people are just okay uh, doing that. It's not a problem. Uh, and that's good. That's awesome. It's not, it's not like that in a lot of places. Uh, but it's, it's a challenge to get from that kind of small talk to actually big talk. Talking about spiritual things. Talking about Jesus Christ. Sharing our faith. It's not an easy thing. It's really not a natural thing. It's really a supernatural thing. And we can't really do it well without the help of God. Even the Apostle Paul often would ask for prayer. Pray that I might be bold. Pray that I might share the gospel faithfully. Uh, we need to be praying for ourselves and for others. Uh, Acts 1.8, uh, Jesus says, The Holy Spirit will come upon you so that you can be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. We need the power of the Holy Spirit, according to Jesus Christ, uh, that power to be his witnesses uh, to uh, this lost and dying world. Third, uh, we must share the gospel without using deceit. Verse 3, for our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. Six times in the letter, Paul mentions the gospel. Again, the basic message of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, that's what we do not want to deviate from. The term error literally means to, uh, to wander from the truth. In our sharing the gospel with others, we don't want to wander from the truth. We don't have to necessarily change the terminology. I've heard people preach the gospel that Jesus died on the cross, uh, not for our sins, but for our low self-esteem. And I'm not making this up. Uh, and that if we come to faith in him, our self-esteem will be better. We'll feel better about ourselves. I'm sorry, that's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ didn't die on the cross because we have problems. And he wants to help us with our... No, he died on the cross for our sins, the things that have separated us. People don't understand that. Remember, that was Paul's first point in Romans theologically is the condemnation of all people. All, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The good things about identifying our behavior as not being problems, 
uh, not being issues that we're struggling with that we just need a little bit of help with, but actual sin. The good news is Jesus died for our sins. Uh, and if we come to faith in him, then the penalty of sin against us, hell and death, is removed. And the power of sin over our life is overcome uh, as well. We don't want to water down or change, uh, change the gospel. It, it's happening. Uh, it's happening maybe a lot. It should be a, it's kind of a concern uh, for people here. Uh, should be at least in, uh, in the United States. Uh, you know, we watched uh, Greg Laurie on our webcast a few weeks ago on a Saturday, and I, I appreciate the fact that even though Greg was speaking to thousands of people in that arena there in Philadelphia, webcast uh, all over the country uh, in thousands of sites, and even uh, people watching on their tablets and computers around, around the world, uh, that uh, as he clearly laid out the gospel, uh, he also clearly laid out uh, the consequences of not receiving the gospel, that people do go to hell, that hell is a real place, uh, that God loves us. Uh, hell was not created for people. It was created for Satan and his fallen angels, but people can go there. That's the con And he just, I just appreciate the fact that he, he laid out the whole gospel of Jesus Christ. We're not doing anybody any favor by telling them half-truths uh, concerning the gospel. Uh, Paul never did. Uh, he said, uh, we never came uh, in error or uncleanness. Uh, again, the uncleanness speaks of his motivation. Never impure, uh, never de deviated. It was all for the glory of God. Uh, and then he uses the word deceit, sometimes translated trick. It's the idea of uh, baiting, a, baiting a hook. Uh, we use trickery or deceit to get someone to uh, confess Jesus Christ. You know what Paul says, Romans 7 and 9, 10? If anyone confess with his mouth, Jesus is Lord. Believe in his heart. God raised him from the dead. You know, he'll be saved. That's all we got to do is get them to We just got to get them to say that. Well, no, it's not just get them to say that. Uh, you know, it's, it's a work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, they need to be convicted of their sins so that they want a Savior to save, save them from their sins. I, I know enough apologetics and that uh, I, I know there are times I could probably talk somebody into saying a sinner's prayer. But uh, if I don't really sense the Holy Spirit is working in their hearts, well, I usually won't do it because if I can talk them into it, somebody else can talk them out of it. Uh, and they will have thought they've experienced real salvation and, uh, and they have it. We don't want to use trickery or, or deceit in every, any way. The Apostle Paul never did. He instructs us not to as well. For uh, we need to share the gospel as those approved of God. Verse 4, but as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. The word approved means allowed or entrusted. Entrusted is the idea of uh, being a steward. Think of uh, Joseph serving in Potiphar's house. And remember, he was the chief steward over his own so that Potiphar knew nothing other than what basically he brought to his mouth. Uh, in other words, only, uh, his only concern was what was on the menu and how good it was because uh, Joseph was such a good steward that he could entrust him with all of the uh, household affairs and all of his businesses and so forth. And God has made us stewards. He's allowed us, he's entrusted us uh, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, and we might uh, liken it to this idea that God's given us a treasure, uh, and that treasure we're able to, uh, to give away. You know, and then we always read about the you know, Powerball lotteries and these guys winning like crazy, you know, $500 million, or crazy money or whatever. Uh, I guess if you had a treasure like that, it wouldn't hurt you to give somebody a couple thousand bucks once in a while. I don't think you'd really miss it, but uh, just in case you win, you know, I, I, <laughs> just a little suggestion. I, I don't think you'd really miss it, but, uh, you know, uh, but actually it would dwindle. Uh, your treasure would diminish every time you gave some away. But God's given us a treasure. Paul says it's, uh, it's actually in, uh, like we're clay jars, clay vessels. We can give the treasure away, but it never diminishes. We've got the greatest thing to give away that there is in the world, eternal life in Jesus Christ. Uh, and that's the idea. He's entrusted us with the gospel. Warren Wordsby says the message of the gospel is a treasure. God has entrusted to us. We must not bury it. We must invest it so it will multiply and produce spiritual dividends to God's glory. What a, what a privilege, but what a responsibility uh, as well. Fifth, we must share the gospel without using manipulation. That's in the last half of verse 4 to verse 6 where he says, Even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. For neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, 
nor a cloak for covetousness, God is witness, nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others. We would say that the end never justifies the means. The end, of course, is having men and women and children come to faith in Jesus Christ uh, and be in heaven for all eternity. Uh, but the end never justifies the means. There's many that believe so. That because the end is so poor, important that uh, whatever the means are, whatever they are, we can justify them. Uh, you know, again, through, through trickery or deceit or whatever, whatever it might be. Uh, but uh, we, we don't want to go there. You know, we want to do what we do, Paul, the Apostle Paul says, with, with integrity. A number of years ago, I was, uh, was helping with Calvary and Alula. We were doing a big outreach. Raul Reese had just released his film, uh, From Freedom to Fury, a uh, testimony about his life. Raul was going to be there that night. Uh, those are the days when we didn't have a facility. We had rented uh, Midpac High School to use their auditorium at, uh, at night. And because Raul was going to be there, we expected uh, a big crowd. And I was in charge of all, all of the follow-up. So I had about uh, 15, 16 folks from the church, and we met ahead of time, had a meeting to uh, kind of go over the follow-up material, how it was all going to work, make sure we're all on the same page uh, and, uh, and everything, and then pray together before the event. And uh, we went through all, I went through all that with everyone, and then, and then uh, a guy came up to me and, sa and said, I don't know, maybe he raised his hand in the meeting, I think, and he said, uh, you know, don't you think it would help if uh, when Roll gives the altar call uh, that, that, that some of us just go, go forward like we're receiving the Lord, you know, to kind of prime the pump a little. <laughs> and it's like, I, you know, I was, I couldn't even believe he even said that. You know, I was just kind of naive. I don't know, you know, I never even thought about stuff like that. Uh, and, he's, and then he's like, I don't think that's a good idea. No, I, I've seen it done a lot of times. You know, it's very effective. But it's like, uh, yeah, it doesn't matter. We're not doing that. You know, we're, we're not, we're not going to do that. You know, we'll just trust the Lord. The Holy Spirit's going to move or, or he's not. And uh, so, you know, we're just, you know, he's all given altar call. Whoever comes forward, I'm going to be at this exit door. I'm going to raise my hand. Raul will point to me. You meet with me. You'll be right outside this door. Whoever comes forward, we're going to just take him out through these doors and we'll pray with him and everything. And, and praise the Lord. There was, uh, there was a huge response. Uh, we Actually, we were overwhelmed. There were 50, 60 people that came came forward uh, out of a crowd of three or 400 to uh, receive the Lord with 15 people to help with the follow-up. So actually, we went outside. I actually had to stand up on a picnic table to address these 50 people that came forward and basically said, um, okay, if this is, if this, if you're making a recommitment to the Lord, you know, you receive the Lord, you've come back to the Lord tonight, you stand over here. <laughs> if this is the very first time you've made a commitment to Christ, the first time in your life, you stand over here, you know. And that was a much smaller group. So then I was able to put people one on one with those guys. And I took the other 30 and did the follow up with them. Uh, but the Lord blessed. But uh, we don't want to get into manipulation. Uh, it's done. Uh, I, I can tell you it's done. And, uh, uh, but Paul says, uh, don't, uh, don't go there. We must share the gospel without using manipulation. Uh, listen to what David says in Psalm 12 about this idea of flattery, is, which is certainly one form of manipulation. Here he writes in verse 1 and 2, Help, Lord, for the, the godly man ceases, for the faithful disappear from among the sons of men. They speak idly, every one with his neighbor, with flattering lips and a double heart they speak. Very concerned there, the psalmist, that uh, people address the Lord and do things with a double heart, with flattering, uh, flattering lips. Uh, some people try to flatter God with their uh, flowery speech. Psalm 78, verse 36, it says, Nevertheless, they, Israel, did flatter him, God, with their mouth. And they lied unto him with their tongue. God's real concern about this idea of manipulation and flattery and saying things that are not true. Uh, we need to do what we do with integrity. The end does not justify the means. The means need to be with integrity. Uh, if the message is, is true, and certainly uh, it is. Uh, Paul shared the gospel without ever trying to be a man pleaser. Uh, and he knew that sometimes it would cause him to... Uh, received strong opposition, obviously uh, uh, imprisonments and beatings or whatever else he went through, but he wasn't going to change the mus message, never become a man pleaser. He wasn't going to manipulate. Six, we're to share the gospel like a mother caring for her children. That's at the second half of verse six. Uh, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ, uh, but we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. So 
Again, the, the metaphor there that uh, neither the Apostle Paul nor I know anything about, but we certainly can observe and, uh, and tell you that uh, as we know that uh, uh, the way a mother cares for her children, uh, that's uh, time and it's energy. It's a sacrificial life uh, to care for uh, your kids. Uh, and what that says, if you do this to those people you're trying to share the gospel with, uh, is that you care. You care about them. It's not just that uh, you've got the gospel, you want to share it, you hope they pray, because if you do, you're going to put one more notch on your, on your King James Bible or whatever it is. Uh, it's, that's not it. It's because you care about them sincerely. And, and they know. People know. People know whether you're, uh, you're sincere or not. Uh, and, uh, and they're watching our, our lives. You know, there's uh, more than one time over the years that Kathy and I have met someone, know someone, and, uh, and we invite them over for dinner for the express purpose of uh, sharing the gospel uh, with them. And uh, it's been said that uh, when people are, uh, uh, can be full of beef and unbelief, so we serve chicken. And, uh, <laughs> Or whatever we have, you know, and we'll, we'll share, we'll share the gospel with them, uh, you know, our testimony and stuff, and uh, people we've gotten to know, and uh, you know, a lot of times they, they don't respond, they're polite, you know, and everything, but we tell them, well, listen, whether you receive the, the, the gospel or not, whether you ever become a Christian or not, either way, we want to know that we love you, we care about you, we're your friends, we'll be your friends whether you ever become a Christian or not, you need anything, you need any help, you always call us, we're, we're that first. We're hoping to win them to the Lord. People are watching, and they, and they can tell. Just to give a little contrast with that would be, uh, would be the Jehovah's Witnesses. I don't know if you ever watched them in their neighborhood. You're probably aware when they knock on your door, and <laughs> they want to sell you uh, uh, a, uh, a Bible that they don't believe in. But it's interesting. They'll, they'll sell you a King James Bible, but uh, that's another, another point. Uh, they give out their material. But one of the things I notice is, uh, is them standing on the street corners quite, quite, quite a bit talking, just talking. And it's because they're just putting in their time. If they, they need to maintain a certain status in their kingdom hall, uh, and to do that, they have to put in a certain amount of hours witnessing uh, every week. So it really doesn't matter if, if anyone ever comes with them to the kingdom hall. It doesn't really matter if anyone ever sits down and do a Bible study. They just got to put in their time. So they're quite willing to put in their time talking on the street corner uh, as well as knocking on the door. Uh, we don't want to be like that. We're just not putting in our time. Uh, we really can't want to care about people because uh, they'll see it uh, in our lives. Seventh, it's like a mother to her children, but also seventh, we're to share not only the gospel, but our lives. And certainly this goes right along with that last metaphor. Verse 8 says, So affectionately longing for you, uh, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives. Because you had become dear to us. For you remember, brethren, our labor and toil for laboring night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. We preach to you the gospel of God. The reason Paul shared uh, with them the way that he did, he says, is because of his uh, love for them. Uh, that was evident because he worked night and day uh, not to be a burden to them. So apparently Paul, Silas, Timothy uh, worked during the day so that he, they would not be uh, any kind of a financial burden or anything else to anyone they were sharing the, uh, the gospel with. Uh, he shared not only the gospel, he says, but our very lives. People watched him. They, uh, they spent time. Now, very often, Paul would arrive in the area. People would receive the gospel. He was only there a matter of months, uh, raising up elders, and then he would move on to another major city. Uh, but very often, he was there uh, quite a long time. Uh, in Acts 19, Luke records for us uh, the Apostle Paul in his ministry where he says in 19.8, And he went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. But when some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way uh, before the multitude, he departed from them and withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannius. And this continued for two years. So that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and, uh, and Greeks. Uh, and I just want to help you understand what, what uh, Luke is saying. He went there first. Of course, his M.O. was always to the Jew first and to the Gentiles. So he went to the synagogues so he could reason from the scriptures who Jesus was in terms of being the Messiah. 
Uh, uh, some of them would believe. Uh, others, what we call Gentiles at the gate, they're there, they're believers. Uh, we meet some of them in the book of Acts, men, uh, meet some of them in the, in the Gospels, uh, men like Cornelius. Uh, and they are there, and uh, man, this is all good news to them uh, because they already believe there's one true God. They embrace, uh, they become a nucleus. Uh, Paul, though, what he does is that when it says, and he lectured in the afternoon, and the lecture stalls of Tyrannius means Paul got up when everybody else got up early in the morning. Paul went to work like everybody else went to work, and he labored making tents, which was not highly lucrative, by the way. He could earn a living. It was a living his father taught him to earn. If you were raised in a Jewish home in that day, even if you were going to be a rabbi, you still learn a trade so you could support yourself. That's what Paul did, making tents. Uh, then in the afternoon, when everybody else would take a break, take a nap, uh, and take it easy, Paul would go to the lecture hall of Tyrannius, and he would teach, and he would preach, and he would minister to anybody that was there for two years. After that time was over, he went right back to work again, and then he would work even longer uh, than anybody else into the evening so that he would not be a burden to anyone. Paul was a hard worker, uh, and Paul put in uh, a lot of time. Uh, and Paul didn't take the normal, <laughs> the normal siesta that uh, uh, that everybody else said, which in a lot of the world they still do. It's hot in the afternoon, and man, they uh, they they can take a break. I can I can testify to that to landing in uh, uh, in India before and, and wanting to uh, go to uh, pay uh, uh, get some rubies so we can pay uh, the tax they want for the uh, the uh, the stuff we're bringing into a church there. They're going to charge us for it, bringing it in, except that oh, the window a little shut. Oh, it's afternoon tea time, and uh, we'll open again in two hours. So now you just get to sit in the airport. It's uh, 98 degrees and 100 percent humidity, and just kind of wait until tea time's over. You know, everyone else is eating tea and cookies and sacking out somewhere. You know, uh, it just you know, there's a lot of parts of the world they just shut it, shut it down for a couple hours. What did Paul do during that time? Man, he used that time uh, to, to disciple others, share the gospel, reason from, from the scriptures. Uh, he shared with his life with them. And if we're going to be effective in winning others to faith in Christ, uh, it's going to be because we're willing to share our lives for them. People are watching us. They're watching our, our lives. Uh, and and what, how we live our lives is, is so important. We would say today... Uh, there's so much uh, animosity against Christian and uh, Christians and Christianity, you know, through the media and so forth, uh, and uh, in our own country here now, which is uh, of course unfortunate. Uh, but you know what? It wasn't so great in the first century either. They didn't get a lot of good press in the Roman Empire. But uh, uh, but Paul was able through his faithfulness. Well, uh, in Asia, they all heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Uh, word spread when there's something good out there, but often. We need to share our lives and be effective in that so that uh, we earn the right to share the gospel with others. We have a friend in, uh, in Tokyo who was, uh, a very, uh, uh, was a chef in a very, very nice restaurant uh, in the Ginza, in a very uh, nice, expensive area, uh, very good at what she did. Uh, and on her day off, one day off a week, on her day off, she realized that there were uh, a lot of uh, elderly people that lived in her apartment building. Uh, so she prayed and came up with the idea that on her one day off a week uh, that she would prepare a nice meal for them and invite them over, uh, which she did. And, uh, and when word got out <laughs> how good it was, uh, just about every person she invited would come. Uh, and she did that for once a week for almost a year so that she could earn the right to finally share the gospel with them. Uh, it's, it's a tough crowd in, uh, in, in Japan. Uh, and, uh, and sometimes people, it takes a lot longer uh, to get through to a person that you really do care about them and their eternal destiny. Paul shared not only the gospel, but his life. Uh, if we're going to be effective, uh, we need to do the same. Eight, we're to share the gospel with integrity. Verse 10, you are witnesses in God also how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who who behave, who believe, so we better behave. Uh, so sometimes there's a credibility gap between the things we say uh, and the things we do. Uh, and, and, and the greater that separation, the greater the, uh, the credibility gap. And with our lifestyle, we need to certainly close the gap as much as we can. Our life is to be holy. In the Greek, that means uh, uh, to carefully fulfill the duties God has given to a person. 
It means having the deepest respect for the things of God. Our lives are to be righteous. This refers to integrity, to uprightness of character, of uh, behavior. Our lives, as Paul says, are to be unblameable. That is, others can't find fault with our lives. Uh, and uh, this becomes an issue uh, in trying to be effective in sharing the gospel. Uh, if there's things that we need to repent from, deal with, have God work in our lives, we need to do that. Otherwise, we'll never be effective in sharing the gospel. Uh, people will look at our lives and go, man, that's not what I want. That guy's no different than I am. Uh, we, don't, we don't want that. We get that sometimes unjustly. But be between us and God, uh, we need to have integrity uh, in, in our lives. Ken Yu says that from his uh, book, Disciples of a Godly Man, the church's greatest need for integrity is directly linked to the needs of a lost world. For the world longs for liberation and dishonesty. Sure, it cultivates and promotes deception, but deep down inside, many people long to escape the pretense. A substantial number of people outside the four walls of the church will eagerly embrace the faith of believers who model the honesty and integrity for which they long. I don't know if you got that, but he, he's saying that, you know, you know the, there's, there's people out there that will joke about and make about, uh, you know, like, hey, let me tell you about how I ripped that guy off. And I can't believe that guy. He's such a liar. Ah, yeah, but I'm kind of a liar myself. They'll, they'll talk about deception. Uh, they'll talk about uh, 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 things uh, in terms of uh, ripping people off and so forth. But in reality, there's still a deep longing in their heart, and they're looking for something because we're all made in the image of God. Solomon says that eternity is written upon all of our hearts. We've all got the same longings that God has placed there. And one of them is for a little truth and integrity. And they might pretend like that's no big deal. It's a big deal. They might be the guy that's leaving work early, signing his side, uh, time card differently. He might be the guy uh, taking things from, from work uh, and so forth. Uh, but you know what? Even if he's doing that stuff, it doesn't mean that that deep in his heart, he's looking for someone or something uh, that is greater than, than his own deception to his, uh, to his own life. God, God puts things uh, in our hearts that are common to all of us. That's why on television, shows uh, that have to do with uh, uh, cops and robbers and law and order and the bad guys do something and, uh, and then it's investigated and they track him down and then uh, he's, in, you know, they find guilty and then, and then justice is met out uh, at the end. None of those shows would be, would be popular. <laughs> There's a bunch of them that are popular. Uh, I, don't, I don't want to start saying names of shows because too many people start shaking their heads. There's a lot of those shows that are popular, uh, yeah, but none of them would be popular if in the end they, they got the right evidence and now they can convict them. But the guy gets off on a technicality. I mean, if that happened a couple of weeks in a row, people would stop watching because everybody's got a sense of justice in their heart that God has placed there. We want the bad guy to get caught. We don't want him off on a technicality. Uh, we want justice in the end. God's placed that in our hearts. Uh, where people are not naturally all about deception and lying and so forth. Uh, they're looking for something real and something genuine. Uh, and again, the church is, there's a great need for integrity. It's directly linked to the needs of a lost world. So we need to have integrity in sharing the gospel. Nine, we're to share the gospel like a father dealing with his children. We had the mother before, now we have the qualities of a father in verse 11 and 12. As you know, how we extorted and comforted, not extorted, exhorted and comforted. <laughs> Might be a few dads extorting. If their kids are successful. God bless you in that endeavor. If you're able to extort something out of your kids, I think that's uh, payback or something. We're all hoping for a little bit of that, I think. That, uh, as you know, how we uh, exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father does his own children, uh, that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. So Paul encouraged, exhorted, and comforted them to live lives worthy of God. How did he do it? Like a father to his children. Uh, in other words, uh, it's personal. He says, remember how I dealt with each of you. Again, like the mother, it takes time uh, of a father. It takes time to develop uh, relationships. Uh, it takes time to develop relationships with people and win them to the Lord. We're thankful for crusade-type ministries and all the other uh, avenues and things, the Internet and everything where people come to faith in Christ. But primarily, about 80% or more, people come to faith in Christ because a person shares the gospel with them and prays with them to, uh, to receive the Lord. That's how most of the people 
uh, in, the, in the ministry here have gotten saved uh, over, over the years. It's just because you guys share your faith with them, you pray with them, they receive the Lord. Uh, that's primarily the way that people get, to, get saved. That's what Paul's talking about here. Uh, again, but when they come to faith in Christ, they need to be ministered to uh, as a father to his children. Verse 12, that you would walk worthy uh, of God. So Paul encourages him. The word encourage is interesting. It's the idea of enabling somebody to walk. When we think about uh, a child learning to walk and you're kind of holding their hands and helping them make those first couple of, couple of steps uh, and everything. That's the idea. But I, uh, Kathy and I saw this uh, in a much more dramatic way uh, a number of years ago as one of the guys in the church had some back problems, injured on the job, had surgery. Uh, surgery didn't go as expected. And when he came out of it, he couldn't walk. Uh, in some ways, he was uh, worse than before. Back didn't hurt, but uh, uh, not walking was not good. So he spent months in physical therapy, just the feeling back, the movement back, the strength back, eventually getting on his feet again. And we happened to be there uh, the day that he took his very first steps. And, uh, and it, was, uh, it was awesome. The whole, uh, I, in my, uh, I tell you, I, a lot of respect for people to do physical therapy. Uh, they are so encouraging, uh, it's unbelievable. They, they got him up, and it wasn't just his physical therapist. They had another to help him, and like the whole staff came around. You would, uh, the way they were shouting and screaming, you'd think somebody just finished the Honolulu Marathon, which is also pretty exciting and very encouraging as well. Uh, but, I mean, he took a couple of steps, and that place went ballistic with uh, cheering and hollering, uh, just all the encouragement. It was uh, how they worked with him and encouraged him was exactly what... Uh, Paul is talking about here, that you would walk worthy of God. Uh, that comes from people that uh, minister like a father uh, to the children, encouraging. And then the comfort, uh, this doesn't mean you put them to sleep. It means he sought to get them uh, active, uh, that uh, God would use them uh, even through difficult times. The word comfort is a word that's usually norm, used uh, normally at a funeral. Uh, there's been a tremendous loss, and you, you come alongside it. Uh, to do what you can to comfort. Sometimes it's, most times it's not saying anything. It's simply just being there, just your presence, that people know that you, uh, you care and you care about their situation. Uh, that's, what, that's what people need uh, in order to come to the Lord. Uh, and then he charged or he urged them. This means he testified to them. Paul, Paul shared his, you can imagine how many times the Apostle Paul shared his testimony. You think of all the soldiers he was, uh, he was chained to over the years. Uh, every town, you know, we think of him, you know, in these uh, lecture halls and the synagogues. Read the book of Acts. He went house to house, house to house, just sharing, sharing the gospel, sharing his testimony. It's something that we have that nobody can take away from us. Everybody's got a story. And uh, some of you got, man, you got great stories. Uh, how you came to faith in Christ, what, what the Lord did. Everybody's got a, got a, a, a before, uh, a how, and then, a, and then an after. Uh, and I just challenge you, if, uh, if you don't share your testimony on a, on a regular basis, it's probably because you haven't really thought it through in your own mind. And it's a good exercise. It's a good thing to do. Uh, a real challenge is, is to be able to, to do it in 30 seconds, to be able to do it uh, in, uh, in a minute. Uh, we used to go down to uh, River of Life and minister uh, down there in downtown, uh, you know, once a month for a number of years. And uh, I, I think that we had... Um, uh, 30 minutes for everything. So uh, one of us, uh, somebody would, uh, somebody would need to get up and, and do a couple of songs, uh, usually a cappella. Uh, then somebody else would need to share a testimony, and then somebody else would preach the gospel. And uh, <clears throat> and uh, a lot of times, uh, if if it was me and Stratton, whoever, we'd be doing junk in a pot to see who was going to do the singing. We're 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 all much more comfortable with our testimony and preaching the gospel than. than to try to get up and sing a cappella, a couple of a couple of hymns, but it all had to click right along. So we had room for a couple of songs. You had five minutes to share your testimony, uh, and then you had 15 minutes to share the gospel, which led to five minutes to do the altar call. The people came to the Lord almost uh, every time. Those those guys down there don't need to be convinced uh, that they're sinners. Uh, they just need to be convinced that God's grace is real, and uh, and so a testimony is so important. Uh, think about how. God, what your life was like, you know, how you got saved, uh, how it's different. Uh, that's what the Apostle Paul did. So very important. 
because I can tell you there is uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, the Buddhists, whoever is out there, they don't have a personal testimony. They have no personal testimony. God has never forgiven them, them of their sins. God has never come into their life. They've never had any change internally at all. They've never had God take away some addictive behavior they struggled with for years. It's never happened, but it's happened with us. Uh, it, it, and God changes and transforms our lives. It's something we got, and nobody can argue with our personal experience of what Christ has done for us. They can argue a uh, deity of Christ. They can argue a lot of things about the Bible, but they, they can't argue what God's done for you personally. It's powerful. Uh, and it's effective to be able to share our testimony uh, with others. We need to convince new believers, certainly of the truth of God's word. But uh, our testimony can be powerful in that. So nine, nine principles. Nine principles about uh, sharing our, our faith with, with others. Uh, but again, uh, at the beginning, we talked about the fact that God is interested in faithfulness uh, and not necessarily numbers. And there's a great illustration of that with Moses himself. Uh, Moses, again, in the wilderness wandering, delivers the people by God's hand out of Egypt. Uh, they're going along, and of course you know that people would complain from time to time. And on one of those occasions, there was a lack of water, so uh, Moses goes to the Lord. And the Lord tells him, listen, just go over to that rock, strike it with your staff, and water will gush out. And remember, he does exactly that. I mean, and when it, it's like a reservoir. It's like this... It's not like a little trickle, like, you know, like I hope we can fill up your water bottle here. It's, it, it forms a lake, basically. He's got a million plus people. They need a lot of water. Tremendous miracle. A period of time goes by and the same kind of occasion arises where they're complaining about a lack of water. And once again, uh, the Lord goes, uh, uh, Moses goes to the Lord uh, in uh, Numbers 20, verse 7. It says, then the Lord uh, spoke to Moses saying, Take the rod, you and your brother Aaron, gather the congregation together. Speak to the rock before their eyes. Don't strike it. Speak to it. Speak to the rock before their eyes, and it will yield its water. Thus you shall bring water for them out of the rock, and give drink to the congregation and the animals. So Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Hear now, you rebels. Must we bring water uh, for the right? That's kind of, I, I, I like to start off a lot of my sermons that way as well. I, I, I didn't do it this morning, but it's a great, great beginning, you know. Uh, Must we bring water uh, uh, for you out of this rock? Then Moses lifted his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod. The water came out abundantly in the congregation and the animals uh, drank. So here's my point, is that uh, the people in that crowd that day or any onlooker could say, Wow, that is a powerful ministry. Miracles, man. You see that guy he hits the rock, the water comes out, the people are rejoicing, and he's got quite a congregation. He's got a million people. Big church. Big church, great power, great miracles. What did God think about Moses' ministry? Well, in verse 12 it says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses in Aaron, Because you did not believe me to hallow me in the eyes of the children of Israel, Therefore, you should not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. You blew it, Moses. It, it, looked good. it could have looked good to a lot of people. Uh, but God was concerned about, did you do what I asked you to do? You know, were you faithful? You know, we all, we're all going to stand before the Lord someday. And we are all hoping to hear him say, enter now my good and faithful servant. Good in character faithful and servants. It's not in or now by good and very successful servant. It's just good and faithful. Uh, God's asked us to deliver the gospel, this treasure uh, that will, in a sense, never run out as we disperse it to a lost and a dying world. There's going to be opposition at times, and it's difficult. It requires patience. Paul uses metaphors like a mother to his children, like a father to his, uh, to his children. Uh, we have to live it out before them personally. Uh, but if we do in the end, again, God is only looking for, well, again, not big numbers, but whether we were faithful to him uh, or not. I just wanted to read a quote from uh, Chuck Colson. He's obviously with the Lord now, uh, but uh, I wrote this a number of years ago as they were getting ready to dedicate their new facility for Prison Ministry Fellowship outside of Washington, D.C. Uh, and he writes this. 
By the time you read this, we will have dedicated our new national office near Washington, D.C. As a result to this and other recent expansions, many people have written to me, in effect, uh, to the fact that, quote, God is obviously blessing prison fellowships ministry, end quote. As much as I am sincerely certain that God is indeed blessing us, I believe even more certainly that it's dangerous and misguided policy to measure God's blessing by standards of visible, tangible, material success. The inference is that things are prospering. Uh, when things are prospering, God is blessing us, and conversely, that when things are going poorly or unpublicized, God's blessing is not upon the work uh, or it's unimportant. We must continuously use the measure of our obedience to the guidelines of his word as the real and only standard of our success, not the more supposedly tangible or glamorous scale. We don't want to fall into the American trap when it comes to sharing the gospel. God's just looking for faithfulness on our part. Uh, we may not have all the right answers. And that's okay. You share your faith. Well, what about this? Uh, you know, I don't know, but that's a good question. I'll get back to you on that. That's, that's, that's okay. You know, that's okay. It's just that uh, uh, it's a very simple message that we have. Uh, we need to be living it out so that we have opportunities. Uh, and, you know, there's nothing more exciting than to lead somebody to, uh, to faith uh, in Jesus Christ. Uh, I can tell you it's uh, fun to go to Disneyland as a kid. It was fun to take my kids. It's even better to take your grandkids. Uh, there's nothing more exciting than, uh, uh, you know, if you, you want to get excited about God, you know, uh, be out there and lead somebody to faith in Christ. Uh, there's nothing more exciting. And then to be able to bring them along and disciple them. But it takes patience, man. Evangelism is patience. And I've had those opportunities, many of you, where you, you share the gospel with somebody, and, man, they, they just receive, you know, like that. But it just... It doesn't always happen that way. A lot of times it's, uh, it's that long, drawn-out building a relationship with someone who is not very nice. <laughs> Can I just share with the nice people? <laughs> you know, a lot of times it's the people that are nice that uh, are probably the most open to the gospel. Because we see sometimes hurting people hurt people. You know, sometimes the people that are hurting the most, it's, it's because they're really hurting. They're the ones that need or maybe even open to the gospel the most. So let's pray the Lord will, will use us. Let's, let's come here. Through our God, we shall do valiantly. It is he who will tread down our end. We'll sing and shout his victory. Christ is king, for God has won the victory and set his people free. His word has slain the enemy. The earth shall stand and see that through our God we shall do valiantly. It is he who will tread down our enemy. Sing and shout his victory. Christ is King, for God has won the victory and set his people free. His word has slain the enemy. The earth shall stand and see that through our God we shall do valiantly. It is he who will tread down our enemies. We'll sing and shout his victory. Christ is King, for God has won the victory and set his people free. His word has slain the enemy. The earth shall stand and see that through our God. Christ is King, Christ is King, Christ. stand in your kingdom oh I'm living in your kingdom 
empty lives and empty cups we come to your cross and you fill us up with your kingdom safe from the storm here in your arm jesus you're my fortress you're my hiding place you're my home my home jesus mighty fortress you're the cornerstone, the solid rock I'm living on. Every time I feel alone, I remember what you told me about your kingdom. Oh, I'm living in your kingdom. Every time I get confused, I tell myself the real good news about your kingdom. Where else could I go now that I know Jesus, you're my fortress, you're my hiding place, you're my home, my home, Jesus, mighty fortress. You're the cornerstone, the solid rock I'm living on. Grace and truth are in your hands. The world's adrift, but here I stand in your kingdom. Oh, I'm living in your kingdom. Empty lives and empty cups we come to your cross and you fill us up with your kingdom safe from the storm here in your arms jesus you're my fortress you're my hiding place you're my home my home jesus mighty fortress you're the cornerstone, the solid rock I live in. Jesus, you're my fortress. You're my hiding place. You're my home, my home. Jesus, mighty fortress. You're the cornerstone, solid rock I'm living on.
Glory to God in the highest, peace to his people on earth. Almighty God, the Father, the heavenly King. A glory to God in the highest, peace to his people on earth. Almighty God, the Father, the heavenly We worship you, we give thanks to you, we praise you for your glory. We worship you, we give thanks to you, we praise you for your glory. For you alone are the Holy One, we praise you for your glory. For you alone are the Holy One, we praise you for your glory. We worship you, we give thanks to you, we praise you for your glory. We worship you, we give thanks to you, we praise you for your glory. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. Come and sing praises to the rock of all. 